Hi, I'm Judith Panera, the Executive Director for AMC and AMC Foundation, the leading organization for all art curators, serving many, not few. It is a pleasure to welcome you to today's virtual discussion. Thank you for joining us. We hope that you, our community of colleagues, allies, and supporters around the globe are healthy and safe. In 2019, we held over 50 programs bringing together more than 1,300 individuals from 19 countries, providing an exchange of information on critical topics for the nonprofit arts community. Since early March of this year, our work has continued to address ongoing issues in the visual arts organizations, as well as concerns rising from the current pandemic. We've greatly enhanced an already robust online programming calendar by presenting varied offerings, such as the one we are gathered together for today. With your participation and feedback, we continue to ensure we are addressing the needs of our audience and moving the field forwards towards an equitable, inclusive, and sustainable future. For many years, we have been presenting webinars, virtual programming, which are accessible on our website through archived recordings. You can also find information on upcoming ones on our website as well at artcurators.org. We hope that they provide actionable advice, value, and connectivity. We welcome all nonprofit art curators to join our organization. Benefits of membership include networking with our global audience, access to discounted and free in-person and virtual programs and fellowships, and importantly, the opportunity to be part of a unified voice for and of curators. Additionally, our foundation serves the larger curatorial and arts community. And should you wish, donations are welcome from you as an individual, a corporation, and or foundation. Any amount will have direct impact on our work. You can see options for donating on our site. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy the program. Hello everyone. Um, welcome to today's webinar. Um, my name is David Saunders uh, and I'm an associate curator in the Antiquities Department at the J. Paul Getty Museum in Los Angeles. Uh, the land and waters around the Getty Center and Getty Villa are the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Tongva, Gabrielino, Tataviam and Chumash peoples. I acknowledge our institution's presence on these lands and pay respect to the ancestors, elders, and relatives of these groups, past, present, and emerging. I felt it was especially appropriate to begin with this land acknowledgement given our focus today. The study of an object's provenance or ownership history is not only an academic or scholarly enterprise, but one driven by ethical and often legal requirements. As curators and museum staff, we are profoundly aware that many objects in our collections may have been deprived of their histories, taken from their owners under duress or otherwise misappropriated. The work that we do to research and document the objects in our care is a means to begin rectifying these wrongs. But it bears stressing that this research itself may take place on lands that have similarly been misused, abused or deprived of their meaning. This is therefore work that we must undertake sensitively in the spirit of collaboration and stewardship and privileging perspectives that have all too often been lost or forced into silence. With this in mind, provenance research should be an organizing principle and priority for any forward-looking institution. And to that end, it's extremely exciting to launch this series of webinars organized by the AAMC. It follows the first series that we developed in 2018. And in the two years since, the profile of provenance research has only increased. To name just two very obvious examples, the Savoy Saar report on the restitution of African cultural heritage and the thousands of objects returned recently by the Museum of the Bible. Where once the practice of provenance research was largely shaped by the ramifications of Nazi looting in the mid 20th century, now it is a field that cuts across all traditional categories of museum collections. The recent volume of essays edited by two leaders in this field, Jane Miloche and Nick Pierce, titled Collecting and Provenance, a Multidisciplinary Approach, demonstrates just how broad this work is and how much still needs to be done. 
I should not delay in recognizing the enormous work of my colleagues at the AAMC who have made this webinar series possible. In particular, Judith Pinero, Monica Valenzuela, Casey Collier, and Glorimar Garcia. And not just this webinar, but all of the resources that the AMC has made available, made available during what has been and continues to be one of the most profoundly testing times in museum history. This is a new three-part series building upon the, we, the one that we organized two years ago. And some of you might remember me, I moderated the final session uh, two years ago, and I'm very happy to provide a this connecting thread and uh, extend the baton starting with this uh, new series. That was in many ways a fairly broad approach, looking at the development of provenance research and curatorial work, its expansion beyond issues surrounding World War II and directions for, for the future. And all of those sessions uh, are available to watch on the AMC's website. The three sessions in this new series will dig deeper and indeed the topics that we are going to be addressing stem directly from the audience responses and suggestions that we received two years ago. So I'm especially thankful to all of you who are watching for your investment and commitment to this topic. And I hope that these will be themes that carry through these sessions. Information about the next two webinars, accessing provenance resources and provenance in current events uh, is available on the AAMC webpage and I won't devote time to detailing those, other than to note that provenance research has increasingly found a place at the heart of curatorial and indeed museum practice, yet I think it's continued to struggle to achieve a designated and secure position in many institutions. So making the case for this type of research is going to be increasingly important. Today, we're going to be looking at the details. As mentioned, our previous series took a fairly general perspective, and while we did present a number of case studies, we didn't really get into the nuts and bolts of doing this kind of research. So looking at what skills are needed, what language specialties or archival access you require, uh, what resources to call upon, uh, what to do when you hit what seems to be a dead end. All of these questions are particularly appealing to me, um, I'm working currently with my colleagues Judith Barr and Nicole Budrovich on a resource guide for researching Mediterranean antiquities, and today's session is deliberately global in its focus. Uh, we have a wonderfully experienced panel of speakers, and I've been delighted to uh, partner with them in developing today's programme, and would publicly like to acknowledge the enormous amount of work they've put into developing their presentations today. Um, their extensive Biographies are posted uh, online, uh, but in brief, it's a pleasure to welcome Najiba Chowdhury, Collections Information Assistant and Provenance Researcher at the Freer Sattler in Washington, DC. Uh, Vanessa von Glischinski, Curator of Southeast Asia at the Weltkulturen Museum in Frankfurt. And Lynn Rotter, Lichtenberg Professor for Provenance Studies at Lufthansa University in Lüneburg. Again, I would stress these are extremely experienced colleagues and I really encourage all of you watching to make the most of this opportunity. This is one of the primary objectives of this webinar is to provide a, an opportunity for discussion and to share expertise. So I really would encourage you to uh, ask questions and uh, provide your feedback. Uh, there is a Q&A uh, tab down at the bottom and that is where uh, you are able to share your thoughts and comments. Uh, the format that we are going to take today, each panelist will present a short uh, offering somewhere in the region of 10 to 15 minutes uh, and our hope is assuming we stay on schedule that there will be time immediately after each of those three three little presentations to um, open space for specific questions and queries if there's a particular name you want to follow up on or a particular angle you want to want to ask about uh, and then in the final set part of this meeting we will have time to go into broader issues uh, and we can collate comments and questions as they come in. But please, as I say, uh, submit your questions throughout uh, the next hour and a quarter, uh, and we will do our best to answer them all. With that, uh, I am very happy to um, set this meeting in motion, uh, and I believe Najiba will be going first. Najiba. Thank you, David. Um, let me start sharing my screen first. 
Thank you for joining us in today's presentation on approaches to provenance research. As David mentioned, I work at the Freer Sackler, the Smithsonian's National Museum of Asian Art. My day-to-day -day job includes helping to manage the database in addition to devoting time to provenance research. I'll be walking you through how I conduct research by using one object from the collection of the Freer Gallery of Art. I'd like to emphasize that from my experience, each object is unique, and one must adjust one's research approach depending on the circumstances surrounding that object. However, there are some common steps and avenues of research one can pursue, which I aim to illustrate in my presentation. In the process, I hope you will also recognize that working on non-Western art is perhaps different than working on Western art and poses its own um, challenges. Before I get started, I want to provide some basic information about the object that I will focus on for the duration of this presentation. This is a sacred sculpture in the Buddhist tradition from modern day Nepal. The sculpture is made of gilt copper and the size is fairly small. It's eight inches tall, about six inches wide, and six inches deep, so it's about the size of my hands here. So it's quite, um, as I mentioned, it's quite portable. The object was accessioned into the Free Art Gallery in 1986. I start provenance research of an object that has already been acquired by reading the information that's already recorded in our database. We use um, TMS, which is the museum system. For example, what's the title of the object? Who gave the title and when? What type of object is it? Is it a work on paper, three-dimensional, What's the date and medium of the object? I look at the photographs that we might have of the artwork. If it's accessible, I'll go visit the object my, um, in person. In non-Western art traditions, the title of an artwork can be quite fluid. Most artists in the context of South Asia did not designate a particular title to their works. So we need to recognize that titles of objects are modern constructions. For example, this sculpture has had multiple names um, since it arrived at the Freer. For a couple of exhibitions in 2006 and 2018, the current curator titled it as Queen Deepa Mala, as the goddess Prajna Paramita. But as you can see on the screen here, um, our current title on TMS is Queen as the goddess Prajna Paramita. This is to emphasize that the title is not a holy grail. If it's not set in stone and if you're researching an object only by its title, you'll miss out on valuable information. The title also changes with new knowledge. I will illustrate this later in my presentation. Then I look in our um, TMS to see if curators or other researchers have written anything on the object. Sometimes this includes explanations or doubt about the authenticity of a piece. It could include academic discussions on an object's dating and the geographic location at the time of the object's making, et cetera. So what's written about this particular object in our database? For this sculpture, indeed, there is a clue. If you look at um, curatorial remark seven, as highlighted with the red um, arrow, it says that it was previously in the collection of Mr. and Mrs. Paul Mannheim. After reading the database, I would study um, the object file, or as some may call it, the accession file. Oh, sorry. I skipped a section. <laughs> so uh, let me go back before I get into um, talking about object files. You also want to look at marks, seals, stickers, and inscriptions. If there is a report, if there is a conservation report on the object, that's also very important because there could be ident um, discussions on identifying marks. Was there recent conservation work done on it? Going back to talking about marks, um, seals, and stickers, these are this can these can be very good clues about. Um, identifying, identifying the artwork you're looking for. For example, this sculpture has two inscriptions. Um, if I'm looking for this piece in an auction catalog, 
this um, the inscription might might make it easier to distinguish the piece based on the inscriptions but it will still be difficult because many non-western objects and auction catalogs especially from 50 or 60 years ago may not have put an image with each of the items that were for sale there are two separate inscriptions in two languages on the pedestal the tibetan um, inscription to your left states that its goddess uma we will revisit this inscription and her identity as Uma. The Devanagari um, script to the right states, gift of Deepa Mala. Deepa Mala was the wife of the ruler Prithvi Mala who reigned in Western Nepal and Western Tibet in the 14th century. So right here, we can tell that this was donated by either Queen Deepa Mala herself or someone close to her circle. To be honest, um, it's not very common for it to find this kind of information where we can successfully retrace the history of ownership to the creation of the object. It's partly possible here because it was a royal commission and because the donative inscription is etched into the copper. Donative inscriptions are not typical in the South Asian context. Artist signatures or marks are not common until 16th century, and even then, those are only limited to particular regions and courtly traditions. After, um, after reading the database, I would study, um, let's go back. After reading the database, I would study the object file, or some may call it the accession file. The object file in some museums will contain very important pieces of information, including an acquisition justification form. For our more recent acquisitions, curators must fill out a form that asks them about the provenance of an ob object. They have to identify whether they think that object was in continental Europe during the World War II period. This is in line with our provenance strategy to prioritize World War II provenance research. Curators also report names of previous owners and related documentation. The object file includes documentation on the collector or dealer from whom the museum acquired a piece. There may be correspondence which gives important details of the consideration that went to, into acquiring the work. What was the circumstance or social context given by the dealer or collector? Did the individual mention how he or she acquired the piece? Who was the previous owner? Are there export documents? Did the, uh, did the piece leave its country of origin before or after 1970? These are all questions to be thinking of. For example, in our object file, we have an invoice from 1986 from Peter Mark's uh, Works of Art, a gallery in New York City, selling this um, sculpture to the Freer Gallery in 1986. Publications. You also want to research and see if the object was published. This could be scholarly publications. It could also be exhibition catalogs, auction catalogs. It could be newspaper or magazine articles. It turns out that this goddess was published in a 1969 book by a scholar of South Asian art. Through this publication, I received my next clue about the sculpture's ownership history. In 1969, uh, or the 1969 publication lists this object belonging to the Brooklyn Museum of Art. And my point about the title, if you, if you see here, the title, title here is again different from what's at the Brooklyn Museum of Arts Registrar's paper, which is Seated Uma. And here, the title is Prajna Paramita. When I fi found out that the goddess was noted as a Brooklyn Museum of Art piece, my next step was to email the registrar there, asking for more information. I want to emphasize that contacting various museum professionals, scholars, researchers in the field and working with them is a very important part of the step. Provenance, provenance research is collaborative work and benefits from tapping into various experts. When I contacted the registrar at Brooklyn, she had difficulty finding any information on the object because when it was there, the title, as I mentioned, um, was not queen as the goddess Prajna Paramita, but seated Uma. If you recall, I had mentioned that there were two inscriptions and that the Tibetan inscription was read to say Uma. Uma is a Hindu goddess who is the wife of God Shiva, whereas Prajna Paramita is a sacred Buddhist text 
that is often depicted as a goddess in the Buddhist tradition. The reason for this confusion occurred because in 1981, a scholar translated the script to read Uma, who, as I mentioned, is a Hindu goddess. Whereas 13 years, 13 years later in 1994, the second scholar read, a second scholar read the inscription asserting that it actually states Yum in Tibetan. The then curator in 1995 posited that Yum refers to Yum Chenmo, the Tibetan name for Prajna Paramita. This goes to show you again my point about the fluid nature of titles in conducting provenance research and how unreliable they can be. When Brooklyn Museum was able to find information on the sculpture, it showed that the object came to the museum in 1967. The paperwork at the museum is not clear on who the object arrived from. They have two competing sets of notices of arrivals, arrival forms from the Doris Wiener Gallery and Walter Randall both from New York City within the span of a few days. The registrar shared their loan and notice of arrival forms with me. Documentation showed that while the object was still physically located at the Brooklyn, the sculpture was purchased by Mr. and Mrs. Paul Mannheim in 1968, less than a year um, after it arrived at Brooklyn from either Doris Wiener Gallery or Walter Randall. In 1986, per Mr. Mannheim, the object was released to Peter Mark's works of art in New York City. Because Brooklyn Museum of Art had two sets of competing and conflicting documentation, and even at the time of the piece's arrival there, there was internal confusion as to who brought it to the museum. As I mentioned, it could have either belonged to Doris Wiener Gallery or Walter Randall before its arrival at the Brooklyn in July 1967. I should also mention that Doris Wiener died in 2011. Wiener's first trip to the Indian subcontinent was in 1966. There were two exhibitions which Wiener organized in 1966, but they were both exhibitions of paintings. I've gone through old journals from the 1960s. Doris Wiener Gallery first put out an advertisement in the art journal in 1967. Her gallery listed a few objects for sale, but I could not find this specific goddess among the ones listed. It's still possible that she acquired the object in 1966 on her travel to the region and subsequently loaned it to the Brooklyn without putting it up for a public sale. Literally, until two days ago, for me, Walter Randall remained an unidentified figure. He did, he did not appear as a dealer or a collector in online searches. Without being able to narrow the search to a specific city, there were too many Walter Randalls on Ancestry.com. In 1967, when the loan receipts were prepared, next to Randall's name, it stated, address unknown. By looking through art journals, I came across an article on the provenance of a Mayan panel, which listed that it belonged to a New York antiquities dealer named Walter Randall who dealt in antiquities in the 1960s and sold the mine panel to the Art Institute of Chicago in 1965. I plan to contact the Art Institute of Chicago as well as the author of the article to see if they can help me learn more about um, Randall. On the same day, I came across another article in the auction section of the New York Times from 1978. The newspaper mentions that Randall bought an African wooden figure at Christie's London's sale for 400,000 US dollars. So it's apparent that Randall dealt in both pre-Columbian and African antiquities. What's not clear is whether he also bought and sold South Asian antiquities at this moment. Therefore, it's, it's still possible that it was either the Doris Wiener Gallery or Walter Randall who acquired the goddess and loaned it to Brooklyn in 1967. Since um, we strive to be transparent and share the provenance of objects in our collection, we have researched this object along with its provenance is, our, is on our collections page. And at this moment, the provenance information on this goddess reflects this unclear information on who was the actual owner of the piece before its arrival at Brooklyn in 1967, along with some footnotes. If anyone has information on Walter Randall or further information on the sacred goddess, please don't hesitate to get in touch with me. Before I end my presentation, aside from demonstrating that a practical example of provenance research of an object, I hope 
I have revealed that working on non-Western art can be challenging. For instance, you may have noticed that I did not mention archives in my presentation. In the case of Doris Wiener Gallery, there is no existing archive. While archives are an inv invaluable part of provenance research, sometimes there are few and far apart when it comes to researching South Asian art. In general, South Asian, South Asia didn't have a strong tradition of written documentation or record keeping. Most of the archives that are available usually contain the documentation of American and European collectors and dealers, and doesn't necessarily trace itself back to the country of origin. I hope I have also been able to illustrate two other points. One, ownership histories can be messy, and sometimes there are ambiguities or gaps in information and we just don't know who owned an artwork at a certain period. Two, provenance research work is ongoing. New information, new resources, and archives could open up at any moment and enrich our knowledge or upend what we thought we knew about a certain object collector or dealer. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Najiba. That was that was great, and sort of provided a wonderful case study for both the, the, the sort of methods and challenges uh, that we all face. Um, a couple of questions have already come in, and again, I encourage those watching to again, if you have specific comments or thoughts on on uh, Najiba's paper, and especially if you know Walter, more about Walter Randall, um, please do uh, submit your comments. Uh, one question here um, is about the inscription or the inscriptions, um, have you, I mean, presumably um, you've been able to verify that they are, they are the date they purport to be an original to the object. I mean, I, I, mean, I suppose more broadly, do you work closely with conservators in studying the physical form of the object? That's an excellent question. Um, in general, yes, I do. If it's needed, I will um, get in touch with the head conservator and the other conserv conservators um, in the museum to discuss um, specific objects. In this particular instance, um, I have not specifically contacted the conservator, but in our, um, in our museum records, um, it posits that Yum was the Tibetan inscription, which was earlier read as Uma, was etched later because it's written in a, a much more crude form compared to um, the donative inscription. So it, it seems, most likely that the, Deepa, the gift of Deepamala, the Sanskrit inscription, that, that was original um, to the making of, it was made basically, it was written at the, it was etched at the time of the making of the sculpture. But there is certain you know, doubt about the Tibetan inscription. But I think that's an excellent point and this has prompted me to um, talk to the curators, or talk to the conservators at, our, at my museum and confirm. And for, I mean, for, for working with the collection you have at the Freer Sackler, what language skills are you having to draw upon yourself to? Um, so I, I, um, I am, um, I have Sanskrit and I know Bengali and Hindi personally, but um, obviously that doesn't span the entire collection, even within South Asian region. So there are, we have two cur curators, um, one is of South Asian, um, working on South Asian art, and there is now a, a curator of Southeast Asian art. So combined, there are some regional languages, even within South Asia, that we, that we can work on. And obviously, I, I didn't mention my European language skills. But sometimes, that's not enough. There could be something that's very, you know, it, it was a very, um, it could be a dead language or it was spoken in Kashmir. For example, there's this Harwan um, panels that we have. And for that, I have to go to a professor who specializes in that language. So it, uh, we try to cover the bases, but sometimes depending on what the language is, you have to um, get in touch with an expert that's outside the museum field. But it, it's, it's kind of essential that you are, um, well versed in couple, at least a couple of European and, you know, Asian languages, I think. Great, thank you. Um, more questions are coming in, but I think in many ways they apply to um, all of the presentations, so I might hold on to them and in the interest of time, um, move on to our, our second presentation. 
Uh, thank you again, Najiba. Uh, if I can hand over to Vanessa. Yeah. Uh, hi there. <laughs> thank you, David. I'm just starting my presentation. Um, white door. Okay. Give me a second. Okay, it doesn't work now. Now it's. Okay, I think now it's visible, right? Can you see the presentation? Okay. So thank you, everybody. Um, before I start to present two case studies from the collection of the Weltkultur Museum, I would like to shortly introduce my institution. So, sorry. Um, the Weltkulturmuseum or Museum of World, Cu World Cultures in Frankfurt am Main was founded under the name of Städtisches Völkermuseum in 1904. So, to avoid confusions, I will henceforth use the present name, which is Weltkulturmuseum. The Weltkulturmuseum was founded by Bernhard Hagen. That's him, uh, who was a medical doctor and who had served for the Dutch colonial administration in Sumatra and later for the Germans in New Guinea. So up until World War II, the museum had compiled quite a large collection, but in 1944, the museum building was destroyed during Allied bombings. And then it looks like this, actually. Um, and at that point, about half the of the collection that had still remained there in storage was lost. But even more dramatic in terms of provenance research is that almost all documentation, letters and files were burned. This is a huge challenge today as the, mu as the museum does hardly possess any documents on its early collection. We are completely dependent on external sources. Today, the collection of the Weltkulturmuseum numbers around 65,000 objects from Africa, the Americas, Oceania, and Southeast Asia, which is my department. How the objects came into the collection differs widely. Reconstructing their provenance is often a challenge due to the lack of documentation, language barriers, and difficulties in both traveling and funding. Nevertheless, in 2018, I co-curated the exhibition Collected Board Looted, which actually came quite in time with the Savoy Sa report. So um, that was very interesting. And the um, exhibition aimed to make provenance research at an ethnographic museum more transparent. The exhibition was part of a larger project in Frankfurt, where a total of five museums presented their current research predominantly with the National Socialist History. Whereas at the Weltkulturmuseum, of course, objects mainly originate from colonial contexts. Still, there are also cases with both a colonial and a national socialist provenance, as we will see. The first case I want to present is a rather typical one for the Weltkulturmuseum Southeast Asia Department an ethnographic collection compiled by a natural scientist during an extensive field trip to today's Indonesia. In 1909 to 1910, the Frankfurt-based geoscientist Johannes Elbert was mandated to conduct a field trip to the eastern part of the archipelago by the Frankfurt Association for Geography and Statistics, which at that time was headed by no one else but the museum's founder and director Bernhard Hagen. He requested Albert to also collect ethnographic objects. In the end, the so-called Frankfurter Sunda expedition brought back more than 1,200 objects, which were then donated to the museum. Luckily, Johannes Albert published an extensive research report from which we can also obtain some information about his collecting practices. Albert contextualizes his research trip within the political frame of the Dutch East Indies and explains he had to adjust his tour to the will of the Dutch colonial government. At the same time, he praises the colonial politics of divide and rule. Albert also occasionally provides information how he, 
his wife or his assistant collected certain items. The range extends from exchanging tobacco and tools to slight persuasions. The objects collected range from raw material to everyday tools, personal belongings and ancestor figures, etc. Thus, it does not surprise that the collecting contexts vary accordingly. For example, during his travels through Flores in February 1910, Johannes Albert asked locals in the region of Ria, which actually does not exist as a name today, which is one problem. So he asked him um, who would be interested to sell objects in a kind of market. In his research report, he describes one scene in great detail. And this is more or less a quote, which I'm bringing now. So at one time, he accidentally took hold of a bag belonging to what he labeled a magic prize. Um, and he immediately handed over payment. The owner nearly keeled over in shock on the spot because he kept remedies and potions in it. As Albert began to unpack the bag and asked about the significance of the different objects, the man flinched and turning a shale paler, answer, shale, a shade paler answered that the sacred stones had fallen from heaven. Then he reached hastily and fearfully for a sacred stone as Elba tried to pack it away, whereupon the latter quickly handed him a larger banknote. According to Elba, the owner finally agreed to the purchase, but before he had repeatedly tried to take the sacred object away from him. It would be very interesting to try and find out more about this specific situation. However, this proves to be quite difficult and challenging. First, also checking through several archives and looking for Albert's estate, he died early in 1918, I could not find any diaries or letters. And secondly, it would need a cooperation with a local institution in Flores to possibly identify descendants of the not named Magic Prize. But there is neither funding nor is there any major institution I could contact in Flores. Until now, there has not been any real interest for cooperation in such a research. So to enter the Albert case was quite easy because of the research report, but to obtain further, obtain further information proves difficult and needs patience. Actually, the best way to proceed would be by extensive networking in today's Indonesia, especially with NGOs and local institutions who are interested in provenance research. But these do not exist in every region. So as a curator, I will have to wait for an opportunity to find out more about the collecting context, for example, by traveling in the region myself or by establishing contacts with source communities. So that's already the second case. And um, it is about another cluster of typical provenances in the Weltkulturmuseum's collection. It's ethnographic objects acquired from galleries in Europe. The provenance of these objects can carry a double burden, especially if they were bought during World War II. They might have both an unjust context of purchase in colonial and national socialist times. A distinct case study for this are the acquisitions of the museum in Amsterdam in 1941. The city of Frankfurt estimated good opportunities to buy both artworks and ethnographic objects for favorable, favorable prices in the countries occupied by Nazi Germany. And Frankfurt provided special funds for acquisition to its museums. So this opens up a lot of critical questions. How did the objects come to Europe? How did they come into the collection of the galleries? Was there put any pressure on the owners and galleries to sell the objects below their value? And was there any injustice in the chain of acquisition? Here I can only shortly sketch the case of the Amsterdam-based art trader Aldering and especially Kunstsaal von Lier. First, I have to state that regarding ethnographic objects and their provenance, art traders are like a black hole of information. So usually, the galleries only keep the basic information of the objects, the ethnic group, the supposed origin and designation. 
only very seldom the information of who collected a certain object, where and when is kept. The Aldering Gallery still exists today, but the new owner was neither interested in establishing contacts with the museum, nor, after many attempts to connect, could provide any documents about sales in the 1940s. Still, the most interesting case is that of Kunstsaal van Lier, as its owner, Karel van Lier, had a Jewish, Jewish family background. When I found out about that, questions about the context of the sale to the German Museum in April 1941 arose. E.g., were the prices of the objects lower than they should have been? Prices for ethnographic, ethnographic objects are very hard to determine, especially in a historic perspective, as we often cannot reconstruct for what price an object was acquired in the field and what value it had for its original owner or the source community, we also cannot reconstruct the European trading value of the objects. Thus, in the case of the museum's acquisitions, we cannot really tell whether it was with favorable, pri favorable prices. The important point in the complex case of Kunstal van Lier was to get in touch with Karel van Lier's grandson, Bas van Lier. Bas himself is a historian and a journalist and had a research interest in the case of his grandfather. Actually, he even wrote a, a book about the gallery. Bas, con uh, Bas construct reconstructed the history of the gallery from diaries and notebooks of his grandfather. He concluded that there is no evidence that his grandfather, grandfather who often had financial problems, had to lower his prices under pressure from the museum. So after World War II, the US military administration for Germany imposed on the museums to hand over all objects acquired in the occupied zones. In 1947, today's Weltkulturmuseum thus returned, among others, 18 objects acquired at Van Lier's to the central collecting point. The CCP sent these objects back to the Netherlands where they were integrated in the, into the state collection or NK collection um, to be returned to the original owner sometime later. And there's a spoiler now, they were never returned with one exception, which you see here on the right side of the picture. So by patiently scanning the digital archive, uh, archive fold three for US military records, we were able to finally reconstruct that 18 objects acquired at Van Lier's were returned from the museum to the Netherlands in September 1947 via the CCP. And um, still today, the museum holds about 30 objects from Kunstal Van Lier, which were not found in the museum in 1947. But the return issue was never brought up again after that. In 2007, then, Bas Van Lier demanded the return of the objects his grandfather sold from the Dutch Restit Restitution Committee, which had opened its online data bank a few years er earlier. However, at that time, only nine items, not 18, were held in this so-called NK collection. The whereabouts of the remaining nine objects are unclear until today. Ultimately, the Restitution Committee decided to leave the objects in the NK collection because Karel van Lier, as a gallerist, made a living from the sale. Moreover, there was insufficient evidence that he had been placed under pressure. One object, an ivory hunting horn, however, was handed back because it was judged to have a particular emotional value on account of this photo. So this is actually Karel van Lier blowing the ivory hunting horn in his gallery in um, the 1930s. And the photographer was Erwin Blumenfeld, which you might know because he's a very popular photographer for um, the Vogue, among others. So Bas himself started the return project out of an interest in the return system and supports the view that his grandfather was not under pressure. He person personally thinks that the hunting horn was restituted out of a 
kind of feeling sorry about the missing nine objects. My favorite quote of Bas van Leer is the following, following one. We have no secure proof about injustice in the provenance of the ivory hunting horn, except for the poor elephant who got his tusk cut off. So um, as a few final remarks, um, I want to add that the important lessons I have learned from both cases of Albert and Van Leer are that even within a cluster of objects, the particular provenance can vary. So each object has still um, to be handled differently. And even if an historical background might suggest a critical purchase, purchase history, there is still an option that a sale or acquisition was a more or less equal exchange. Besides intense and patient research in ar archives, networking, uh, in archives, networking and context to descendants or source communities prove one of the most effective and valuable methods so far. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Vanessa, that was great. Um, we have uh, lots of good questions coming in. Many of them, I think, are going to be applicable across um, all three presentations. But if there are any uh, queries specific um, to uh, Vanessa's presentation, um, this is uh, a little moment uh, to do so. Um, one sort of thought I had, you mentioned sort of trying to um, reach out to source countries and local institutions. Having done the exhibition, has that provided more momentum um, to your inquiries? Um, so actually, after we opened the exhibition, as I, as I said, we were in the situation that we opened in August 2018, and I think a few weeks earlier, the Sar, um, Subway Sar report was published. And um, that was a very interesting situation because we had a lot of visitors from the academics. Um, even uh, Ms. Sawa came and visited us and had a discussion with us, which was very productive. So um, we had a high interest in the exhibition, but we didn't have more requests than before from the source communities. Um, I even had the situation that the um, amb ambassador of Indonesia came to the exhibition and we talked about the case of Albert and he said, yeah, so why should we take it in return? Because um, it's not interesting for us. People in, in um, Flores are mainly Catholic today. Why should, what should they do with this magic priest stuff, right? And that was very interesting, but um, until now, there is, is nothing like we have a higher attention for, for return requests or something. But we have a high interest um, of source communities of working with us. And I've got two very, I think, discreet and specific questions. Um, one was the photo from when Blumenfeld was in Amsterdam. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, you also mentioned that the um, Adelink Gallery was unwilling to cooperate. Um, yeah. Are you able to, is there any approach you can take to compel them to do so, or are you, is it essentially a stalemate? Um, yeah, so, so for Blumenfeld, um, just to add that, actually Blumenfeld, because uh, um, he was the neighbor, he had a shop for bags, just a few for leather, leather works, just a few meters besides um, Van Leer. And he was um, doing his first photos and they were close friends and um, Van Leer um, asked him because he, I think he helped them out with financials or something. And then he did that so photo session, which, which is actually something today we would say, say it's like a selfie fashion um, because they have, it's a series of pictures. For um, the other question was with Aldering. Yeah, the Aldering case was like, I'd, we had another gallery we contacted in France, which is a good example that, that this can vary um, also. With Aldrink, I emailed and I tell, tried to telephone and I, I couldn't get through. And then actually, um, Bas van Leer, the grandson of Karel van Leer, who still lives in the neighborhood, said, come on, I will just walk over and talk to him. And they were very close and they really said, no, there's nothing, nothing left, nothing left. And they were just blocking and said, no, we don't want to work together. 
that was different with the French gallery. Um, I'm sorry, I forgot the name because my, my colleague worked on it. The Fra Fra French gallery, um, they really got in touch with us and tried to find documents and they were really motivated. Also, they did not really have lots of materials. So it's very different how this can turn out. Thank you. Um, let's move on to our final presentation. Thank you again, Vanessa. Um, I'd like to hand over to Lynn. Thank you, David. Thank you to AMC and hello to our audience. Let me share my screen. Can you see my presentation? Everyone? Yes. Okay. So I will be actually focusing on an example from my previous position when I was overseeing provenance research at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. So what I will be speaking about today is we are looking um, at a painting here by Shaim or Chaim Soutin, titled Dead Fowl from 1924. The provenance information that you see on the right of the screen basically says that it was owned by Mr. and Mrs. Justin Tannhauser, New York, by 1956, and that the Museum of Modern Art received it as a gift in 1958. So this rudimentary information was more or less until two years ago on MoMA's website and was published and compiled in the early 2000s. Tannhauser is what we probably, or at least in New York, could consider a household name um, due to the major gift of masterpieces by Manet van Gogh, uh, etc., that were given to the Solomon Guggenheim Foundation. But just to recap or like just give a very small uh, point is that the Tannhausers actually came from a very important German art dealer family originally based in Munich. And it was Justin and his wife, Kate, or then Kate, who emigrated to the US. They fled in 1937, first to Paris and then to New York in 1940. However, this painting, as the provenance information on the right indicates, was owned by them after the war. Still, it was important to include it in the provenance research project of MoMA at the time because it had a gap of more or less 32 years. And of course, because it's a French work, it was in France or it was in Europe, and that also means potentially Nazi Europe at some point. As also by Najiba already mentioned, one uh, one source for provenance research can be the object itself. In that case, however, the Soutine painting was, the old stretcher was removed by the conservation department in the 60s, and therefore the painting itself had actually little to offer. However, another source is internal documentation, as we also had already covered in the earlier presentations. And this meant looking at the register card, for example. The register card created at the time of the acquisition, 1958, also noted some provenance marks. So you see numbers 44, you see E38, you also see that the registrars noted French customs, Chenu. Chenu was a shipping company in Paris, but of course this information, as rudimentary as it is, it also didn't offer it didn't offer any more insights into the provenance. The other internal documentation to look through was the entire correspondence. That actually in that case was also quite uh, comprehensive because the painting was first, um, was first a promise gift, then a fractional gift until it became a full gift. And the document that I show here is the earliest one from March 1956. But although this material was quite a lot of, is quite a lot of correspondence, provenance was not mentioned at all. This letter, however, also shows, this letter, however, also shows, sorry, my phone was ringing. That happens when you are at the discomfort of your home. Um, this letter also shows a different title. 
So that file is how the work is recorded today, but here it actually is a bit more precise and it says booster. The other natural step at the time in the early 2000s was to look at the, uh, to look at the uh, catalog resume that was available at MoMA's library at the time. And that was uh, the one from 1972 or 73 from Crotillon, which is C. Soutine. And in fact, there were many dead fowls. There were roosters, turkeys, ducks, chickens, and pheasants. But the painting that is in MoMA's collection to this day was not included. The other obvious step at the time, still valuable today, and in the early 2000s, more or less the one source to go for provenance information was the AAM Guide to Provenance Research. And in that case, again, Tannhausers weren't even mentioned. It was believed that the entire archival records of the art dealer family um, didn't survive. And this is how the information was compiled at the beginning, and this is how this provenance with this gap of, 19, of 32 years was uh, published at MoMA's website. But it also says provenance research is a work in progress. And especially uh, with American museums that had started Nazi era provenance research as early as 2000, we have now 20 years later different resources, and this is what I would like to uh, show in my next uh, steps. And it did, I would, even, or I would even go as far to say that actually provenance information is constantly outdated. And even the 10 years that I spent with provenance research is that the field has constantly shifted the methodologies, the level of professionalism, the resources that are made available, the sources that one can search for, etc., have changed so much that I would go as far to say it's constantly outdated. And in the case of this routine, it turned out, in fact, that the Tannhauser records weren't completely lost or destroyed when Hilde Tannhauser, which was Justin's uh, second wife, died in Switzerland. Some files of the gallery were found and were then transferred to an archive in Germany. Obviously, I, with this big Nazi era gap, it was clear that we have to visit these archives. But one thing is also what happens often in provenance research, you're actually revisiting the same material again, or to try to look what was done 10 years ago or 20 years ago. And in that moment, it was that it also turned out that actually the labels had remained in the conservation department. So sometimes labels are being removed from a stretcher and then being attached again on the painting. Sometimes they ended up in the curatorial files. Sometimes, as in this one, rarely that they have remained in the conservation department. I will not go into the details of the labels, but I think what is important to, to emphasize is that the registrars, as uh, diligent as they were at the time by by recording all these labels, they did not record the handwritten annotations. And uh, when you look at the, the Chenu label on the bottom of the left, it says Musée de Toledo, and it says Gampel. And this shipping label, of course, you don't know if it's Toledo in Spain, Toledo in the US. The only thing is that is obvious is that it's written in French. And that might indicate that Gampel actually refers to René Gampel, who was an art dealer active in Paris in the 1920s and 30s, who was Jewish and who was then, uh, who actually died in a German concentration camp near Hamburg in 1945. And his son survived World War II and started Gampel and Sons in London. However, with these labels, this I think is also in general true, that these labels cannot, um, give the entire, uh, that you cannot reconstruct the entire history of ownership by only labels. So the next thing, as mentioned before, was to go to the archives in Cologne. Newer development is, of course, that we have websites with archival documentation. And this is true for Cologne. I'm showing you the English version. 
which means that the headlines are English, historical note and everything else is in German, which I think is, it's one, uh, yeah, it's, I've, I'm afraid to say it's sort of typical for German archives that they rarely have any English information. However, what you see is on the left, various series and don't bother to read them in detail. I will uh, zoom in in a moment. But you see on the left various series and for provenance research, it is, uh, of course, business correspondence, lectures, stock books, etc., can reveal information. A newer development is also that archives actually digitize their West, West holdings. And that also happened here. The majority of the material is digitized. While the material was processed, also archivists actually recorded uh, the content of documents. However, one cannot access it from anywhere other than from the archives themselves for legal rich, um, restrictions. But you can search for specific keywords, names, etc. So that's what I did. And for Soutine, you find various folders and various documents that then one can look at while being at the archives. But this is from, uh, from my experience, I would always urge to, to, or I would always emphasize how important it is to also get familiar with the archives tectonic and to go through the structure and see if there might be anything else where you find the work. Because exactly in that case, these actually among the, among the website search for Soutine, the document was not relevant and it was from the inventory books of series 19 that I have looked systematically through and I found this. This is a page of the notebook of Justin Tannhauser and you can easily read, I hope. <laughs> Here it says Rooster. Here it says Gampel. Here it says 1930 to 1954 Toledo, or 1930 minus 54 to be more precise. Here it says something called I am Stettenheim, see above cat page 267. And this might refer to this catalog of European paintings that is indicated here. So as confusing as this notebook might seem, it's always extremely promising course, to find actually at least something that, that sounds familiar and might give, might give further insights. But before uh, we were able to, to sort of uh, dig deeper into the story, an email reached MoMA through provenance at moma.org because this rudimentary provenance information that I had showed at the beginning was still on MoMA's website. And it was a scholar, her name was Diana Kosturko, an Australian-based um, provenance researcher and scholar who had just published in fall 2017 an edited version of the journal of René Gampel. This is what I show you on the left. It was based on the diary by René Gampel that was published posthumously in 1963, which I show on the right. And in this book, in fact, and I will read it to you, it says, uh, it was recorded on May 12, 1930. My friend Stettenheim of New York has given me the money for a turkey. Now we have a turkey by Soutine. I've not seen a more beautiful one for 40,000 pounds. So it turned out that the dealer Gampel bought the dead fowl in question for the Toledo Museum of Art in Paris in 1930. And it was that Gampel was actually assigned to be the advisor for living masters in the Toledo Museum in Ohio. And now come to the end. So you see again, you see the label of the Paris shipping company, which says Musée de Toledo. It was Gimpel, Gampel who bought it. It was Tannhauser's notebook, but he had mistaken collection Stettenheim because what you see on the right is the catalog of European paintings and there it says gift of I am Stettenheim why in fact Stettenheim had only provided the funds and this is this was uh, almost solved the story 
But even more so, uh, it turned out that this particular fowl was actually also auctioned off in 1926, and it was the most important, uh, the most expensive Soutine painting that had been sold to that year uh, at an auction. And this all together then became the updated provenance uh, information on Momo's website, and it was from June 2nd, 1930, owned by the Toledo Museum of Art, purchased from Osru Lalotte, he was the buyer at the, at the Paris auction. It was sold through René Gampel with funds provided by Isidor Stettenheim, and then it was deaccessioned in exchange to Justin and Kay Tannhauser, and then it became a gift by Tannhauser to MoMA. And this is what I would like to, maybe also as part for question for the discussion, but I think with provenance research, three important aspects are noteworthy. One is that provenance research is ongoing, or as I earlier said, it is constantly outdated. Provenance evolves over time due to constantly new archival resources that become available. It is resource intensive or painstaking, tedious, due to the massive documentation that has to thoroughly be reviewed in archives around the world. And it is crowdsourced. Museums and anyone else conducting provenance research depends on information from the art market, from claimants, but also from specialized scholarship on the history of the art market, on topics related to provenance research in general and Nazi looting in particular. And this is how I would like to end. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. That was superb. And again, really highlighted so many of the challenges and opportunities that, that this work faces. Um, we have, by my watch, six minutes left. Um, one very specific question has come in um, before we go to a more general discussion. Um, how long did it take you to assemble this, um, maybe not final, but um, to, to, to kind of do this, do this research? That was a question for me, right, David? Yeah, how long, yeah, the process of working on that particular painting? Yeah, for me personally, it was maybe in total less than a day, but that was just this lucky coincidence of like going to Cologne for a conference and then taking the advantage, going to the archives. I had compiled all Tannhauser works, all works in MoMA's collection that went or might have went. So then I checked very systematically and very quickly. And it, then it was this coincidence that Diana Kosturka reached out before I spent hours, days, months, weeks, or yeah, to figure out more. So that is, and maybe that's one of the things that I would like to also say because European museums are so hesitant in sharing provenance information on their websites. And I think it's really a missed opportunity because this is expert knowledge that you rely on and that then in the museum can help you to piece that together. Yeah, in such a short, with actually spending so little time on it. Yeah, and that, I mean, that was something I noted down, your, your point that provenance research is constantly outdated but also the value of having some information up there because people are willing to share. And, and so no, that's, that's really valuable. Um, I will try to work my way through the, the many questions that we have. And again, please um, feel free to submit your questions in the Q&A field. Um, first one is for all, all the speakers, um, what are your strategies for researching objects that do not have all of the paperwork or collection justifications or modern documentation. What's your, what are your strategies for um, these apparent dead ends or obstacles? There, there it goes, hi. So um, actually, um, at, if you're working with ethnographic objects, we often have this dead end. Actually, we always have this dead end. It's um, like, as we often only have the collector, but we don't have anything about the collecting situation. It's very important for us to look at the context, the historical context we can reconstruct. For example, in the Aldering Gallery, we have um, 
like a cer ceremonial head for sultans. Um, and we did now really just a few information about it because Aldering could not hand over any more information. But um, I read into the history when it could have been collected approximately. And then it turned out that it was from the time of the Aceh Wars, which were really bloody and which were one of the last great wars the Dutch fought against the um, in, or in the East Indies. And so at least we could reconstruct the broader context. And from this broader context, I aim to, to move on. Still, we have a lot of dead ends. But for example, um, this is different with, with an object from Nias, where I would really have to, because I looked for the broader context of missionary work, which concluded me, uh, from which I concluded that it must have been taken by missionaries and then I now have one contact where I could try to find out about the village it is from. So it's really step by step but it's uh, it needs a lot of time and patience and um, I think Najiba also um, spoke about it, language knowledge because for me I can speak Bahasa Indonesia but I can speak um, Bahasa Nias for example which I probably would need for that, so, so far. Yeah, I think I can only stress that uh, at least if you work with a bigger collection, like in a museum or in a, or even as dealers, these are the, the way, if you have barely no information, I would not spend too much time on it. I would record the information I have and put it out there, put it, put it on websites and also share it with experts, like ask different people. This is, it's, a, it's just not possible actually, if you are responsible for one collection to become an expert on not only every object, but on every change of ownership, on every dealer, on every country, on every, etc. It's sort of a, it's a never, um, it's just too much work for generations and for basically the entire museum stuff. And also because provenance research has been sort of neglected for decades, I would say, especially in Europe. So you depend on, you depend on the outside. You depend on universities, students that find it and dig deeper. Just want to add one quick um, thing to what already my peers have mentioned. I mean, this might seem very obvious, but if you're looking into early museum ac acquisitions, you if there's um, if there are archives that already exists in your um, museum, there might be things in there about the you know the collecting history of the museum, and you also want to, if there are known figures or it's a big collection of objects that you acquired, um, you know from a collector or a certain area and region or time period, you want to prioritize that and maybe you can work in, um, put it in a group and, and like Lynn said, like contact um, researchers and scholars and put it out there. Thank you, Najiba. Um, we're coming up to a quarter past the hour, so I'm going to have to sadly draw a line under our conversation today, but this is, part of an ongoing series and uh, the next two webinars in particular will I think present the, the social context in which provenance research takes place um, which again in the current climate is especially pertinent and these are topics that we will explore more fully in the next two webinars. Uh, for the time being um, I very much thank Lynn, Vanessa, Najiba, Najiba and all of our AMC colleagues uh, for this um, wonderful introduction and look forward to seeing you all for the next two sessions. Thank you.